welcome everyone to another episode of Movies About Music. Yeah, and today we watched Amadeus. Amadeus, Mm -hmm. which is about... Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. That's right. Why is it called Amadeus, I wonder? Do you know? Like, is that his middle name? Mm Mm-hmm. So why would they call it Amadeus? Because I guess it sounds better. I don't know. I can only think of Amadeus, 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 Amadeus. I don't know what that reference is. Really? Mm -hmm. That's from the early 80s. What was that guy's name? Falco? Um, Rock me, Amadeus. Come on, then rock me, Amadeus. I wasn't born at that time. Okay. It was really, Falco was really big (laughs) when I was a kid. And all the people who are like under 40 have no idea what I'm talking about right now. (laughs) Anyway, we saw the movie Amadeus, Mm -hmm. and we watched the director's cut, which is a full three hours long. Yeah. It's 20 hours long. Yeah. It's 20 minutes longer than the original. Yeah, it was already a pretty long movie, but the director's cut was like, wow. Yeah. And the director's cut has um, boobies. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, what did we think of this movie? Well, I'm a little biased, because this was like my first favorite movie it came out like the year i was born or the year right after i was born or something Mm -hmm. i was like 1984 right i watched it at a very early age and then we got the video cassette and i watched it over and over and over again it was like my video cassette yeah the The vhs yes and it was one of interesting i just realized that the two movies about music that i grew up with are were amadeus Mm-hmm. And The Sound of Music. Okay. And they were both based in Austria. Yeah, yeah. And when I went to Austria, mm-hmm. I did both the, <laughs> the Mozart tour, where they give you the Mozart coin chocolate mm-hmm. at the end, mm-hmm. and The Sound of Music tour. <laughs> oh, my friend Suzanne is going to love that you said that. <laughs> so my trip to Austria was very, very special to mm-hmm. me. <laughs> Yeah. And it was funny because there was a tour guide at the on the Sound of Music tour. You know, the Sound of Music is about about music obviously, but it's also about World War 1, mm-hmm. right? And so um the Nazis Adolf Hitler obviously came up during the, mm-hmm. you know, the Well, you know, day. Zizek says that the Sound of Music is just a, an allegory for Nazism. I know. I don't believe that, honestly. Just I'd like, that. <laughs> Once, but, <laughs> go ahead. But it was funny because, um, you know, the tour guide mentioned it and that, you know, obviously the, the fact that Adolf Hitler was born in Austria, he's actually Austrian, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, yes. you know, and she was like, yeah, and this, you know, we have to mention this and blah, blah, blah. And I was so warped in Amadeus, Mozart and uh, The Sound of Music, that I had completely forgotten about Hitler. Okay. Like, that's how big this movie was to me. (laughs) Okay. You just skipped right over the Hitler part. I know. I just don't, you know, when I think of Austria, the the last thing I think of is Hitler. And that's how rich, you know, this movie was right. to my childhood, like this, okay. how affected I was um, by this movie and all the the sounds, but, but all, also the images, you know, mm-hmm. just the costumes and it was you yeah. know, all that. Yeah. So I loved it. I watched it again as a, an adult just now and mm-hmm. I loved it again. I love it. Mm-hmm. How about you? I saw this movie when I was young. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if I rented it or I saw it in the theater. I don't think I saw it in the theater. I probably rented it. Mm -hmm. You know, VHS at Blockbuster, (laughs) probably around 1988, Mm -hmm. you know? (laughs) And I remember thinking, okay. You know what I remember about this movie? I remember the commercials. Mm -hmm. So there were commercials for this movie Mm -hmm. on the TV. Mm -hmm. And the commercials would just be a montage of this actor laughing in this really I totally remember that yeah um I shouldn't say this but girly way yeah and I I was like oh that's silly yeah it kind of sounds like (laughs) that's it yeah yeah, the second one you got it so um Tom Hulse is the actor right it was like a gimmicky thing that he did for Mozart I get it now but when I was you know like whatever age I was when Mm -hmm. I saw the movie I'm like well that looks you know I was too cool man I was wearing my leather jacket I don't want to go to a movie and watch this guy you know, do this kind of yeah sissy laugh. Yeah, you were like cool. Yeah, I was Mr. Cool Guy. Prog rock and yeah, but eventually yeah. I watched it at some point, 
And I thought, okay, it's okay. Mm -hmm. Um, Watching it now, I think I appreciate it much more Mm -hmm. because what I got from this viewing Mm -hmm. as a seasoned film goer and musician Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm -hmm. was a real appreciation for the art of composition. Yes. But you know what I really liked about this movie besides the costumes? (laughs) We should say it was it was actually filmed in Prague. Yes. So I've been to Vienna and I've been to mm-hmm, Prague. Mm-hmm. I didn't care for Vienna very much, mm-hmm. but I loved Prague. Mm-hmm. Well, Vienna was... I loved Vienna because it was part of The Sound of Music. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. That's yeah, another I got that. episode. Well, you know, yeah. I, I also was in Vienna for two days yeah. and mm-hmm. I felt underdressed. Mm-hmm. That was that was oh, my takeaway from yeah. being in Vienna. It was very cold. No, I mean underdressed in terms of everybody was... Wearing fancy clothes. Mm, Yeah, yeah. Walking around looking all upper bougie Mm -hmm. uh, with their scarves Mm -hmm. and their long hair. Okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I I just wanted to go to a cafe and sit in a cafe and have an espresso. And I couldn't sit anywhere because they were all full. Yeah, okay. I see what you're saying. I was very bored. Yeah, I didn't care for Vienna very much. One little correction. The Mozart tour I did was in Salzburg and not Vienna. Salzburg is the birthplace. I also went to Salzburg and I like Salzburg much better. Oh, Mm -hmm. you know what? Mm -hmm. That's it. Mm -hmm. In Salzburg, Mm -hmm. I saw the Mozart statue, statue. I think the statue of him is in Salzburg, not Vienna. Probably, because Salzburg is like Mozart city. Yeah. Yeah. I like that city. Uh, yeah, it was really cute. And you know what? It was. I'm sorry to turn this podcast into a travel podcast. A movie about places. Yeah. <laughs> but um, there were these kids, these boys. There was a boy choir, like, you know, at a festival. And then there were also these, like, kids wearing those little German-looking uniforms with the shorts and the little hats. The triangle hats. Yeah, the triangle hats. And they were playing these like little flutes. And it was really cute. So there's a lot of like this tradition Mm -hmm. that was preserved. And it kind of made me feel like I was in a movie. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it it felt like Disneyland Mm -hmm. for classical music. Mm -hmm. Um, So I really liked it. Really liked it. There is a simplicity to, you know, their the life there i guess Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know it's a lot of like coffee drinking and music. oh yeah and that's all i wanted was it are you talking about salzburg or salzburg yeah 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 Yeah, i like salzburg much better yeah and so going back to the movie (laughs) yeah let's talk about the movie you know what i really appreciate appreciated about this movie this time around the depiction the verbal descriptions of the music were really beautiful yeah that's what Mm -hmm. i was talking about that that's what i meant so the verbal in the sense of Kind of composing out loud, you mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, also, but like Salieri would describe Mozart's music. I see what you're saying. So the description of of his music. Yeah. Yeah, So let's set up the plot a little Mm -hmm. bit. We've Mm -hmm. got this old man Mm -hmm. who is Salieri, who is uh, a Italian... Who's the court composer. Who's the court composer in... Vienna. Right, the for Austrian the emperor. the Austrian emperor. Thank Joseph you. or something, yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. so he is, you know, Mr. High and Mighty. He thinks that God is working through him to become a brilliant composer. This mm-hmm. is his desire. This right. has always been his desire. Right. And then along comes this punk-ass kid, Mozart, who's better than him, mm-hmm. which is basically the plot. Mm-hmm. And so uh, Salieri aims to usurp him and eventually kind of plots to kill him and steal his final composition Mm -hmm. and claim it as his, that Mm -hmm. he can then say he is written for our beloved dead Mozart. Mm -hmm. Right. Which is pretty sinister. Mm -hmm. This is fictional. Mm -hmm. This is, I think, the director's name is Milos Forman Mm -hmm. of this movie, by the way, who's Mm -hmm. a great director. Mm -hmm. He did, he's a Czech director. Mm -hmm. He did One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Mm -hmm. He did this film. He did Mm -hmm. The People vs. Larry Flint. He did Hair, the musical. Mm -hmm. Milos Forman has said that this is like a fantasy of Mm -hmm. Mozart. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it's based on Mozart's life. It made me think in the sense of Shakespeare in Love. Totally. Which is like a fictionalized Mm -hmm. version of how did Shakespeare. What was the inspiration for Shakespeare to write Romeo and Juliet, mm-hmm. this incredibly beautiful play? Mm-hmm. So we have this character, mm-hmm. you know, the great, great screenplay by uh, Tom Stoppard and a couple of others I can't remember. Mm-hmm. I love this film. Yeah, I think the thing that I really 
in terms of a movie about music, it's mm-hmm. absolutely a movie about music. It was such a movie Deeply. about music. Yeah. yeah, it was really like a movie about music. Yeah, that's and and would you agree with me? It's because of these this this kind of keying in and as to the beauty of something totally. that's ineffable and yeah. impossible to really properly understand, which is yeah. the genius of music. Yeah. Yeah. It does genius really well, and it does music genius really well. Totally. And then there's Salieri said something like, you know, he was describing one of Mozart's compositions. It was, I think it was for something for the oboe and clarinet. I recognize the tune. And oh, he says the oboe. Yeah. The melodic line of the oboe transitions effortlessly into the clarinet. Yeah. And then he said it was filled with longing, this unfulfillable yes. longing. Mm-hmm. The, the This longing, I think, in Salieri's point of view, was the longing for God, right? Because he's a deeply Catholic, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. as we've seen throughout the entire movie. Right. He's a very, very Catholic Italian man. Yeah, he's a typical Hollywood <laughs> evil yeah. God lover. Yeah. And so he he thinks that God is out to get him by only giving him enough talent to recognize the genius of That's Mozart. It. <laughs> but not being able to compose for the Lord, you know, God. So right? this is why he comes after Mozart, mm-hmm. is to get revenge on God. Exactly. So it's not against Mozart necessarily, but it's he's going after God. Because yeah. God promised him, right. made him a composer, right. but didn't make him his instrument, right? Right. And so he's deeply offended personally by God's choice of instrument, Mm -hmm. right? And also there's this theme of a genius, a child prodigy. And what I call, I mean, what everybody calls um, the l'enfant terrible. I think it translates directly into the terrible baby, but it's basically like, you know, it implies the genius who behaves terribly Mm -hmm. because, Mm -hmm. you know, he's brilliant and gifted or she and causes trouble right right and there's all there have been just so many examples of this throughout history and Mm. then we hollywood definitely celebrates it right yeah sure yeah and every movie about a musician is a l'enfant terrible Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. movie i think in my opinion and mozart was Definitely, like, it kind of sounds like he was the original. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of the encapsulation of yeah, that, isn't it? of the rock star, right? Right. Yeah. There was also, you know, I really liked that he was a popular com- composer. He was a genius, but he later transitioned into becoming a very popular composer. Like, he composed for the common people. Yeah, this movie, I should say I don't know very much about Mozart. Mm-hmm. I like Mozart's music. I listen to it. I love the Requiem in particular. I, of course, I know the different Mozart pizzas, but they usually come on, uh, you know, like a random playlist that I have. Yeah. But I can I can recognize the melodies. Mm-hmm. But at least in the movie, it was it was depicted that Mozart fell out of favor with the court, and he had to make money, and so he went into this vaudeville kind of mm-hmm. composition. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And which was the magic flute. Yeah, yeah. the magic flute. Yeah. Right. And so he starts making money off of mm. off of these shows. Mm. What I found interesting was, at least as the way they were portraying, portraying it in the film, mm-hmm. he wanted to do this uh, forbidden opera, Figaro. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, I guess it's called The Marriage of Figaro. Mm-hmm. And the court was like, no, you can't do that. That's a band, that's a band story. Mm-hmm. He says some interesting things during that time when he's trying to defend his mm-hmm. right to mm-hmm. do this. Mm-hmm. First of all, there's there's a continual theme of censorship in this movie. Definitely, yeah. And maybe we can talk about that in a little bit. Mm-hmm. But I saw him as defending Figaro in a way to say that this is going to be something for the people. Mm-hmm. That this is something that the people can, you know, understand. And and you you start that's when I first got the hints of, oh, this there's a rock star element to this guy, a rebellious yeah. element to this yeah. guy. And then when he of course he falls out of favor with the aristocracy. Right. And he goes into, you know, composing music for the people and conducting music for the people. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was an interesting shift. Right. So there's a classist element right. going on where he decides he's going to be a writer for the people now. Right. Um, I don't know if that was a decision, though. Like I don't By Mozart? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. From what I got from the film, this film, is that he just loved being recognized and adored. Well, there's that, too. Yeah, yeah I just meant in terms of, of the film arc, right, not right, in right. terms of, right. of Mozart's life. Yeah, that, I think that was like some sort of 
like the director's intention I think so was reflected in. I don't know how I wonder, historically yeah, yeah, accurate I, I that wonder, is. Yeah. But I do, I was watching this film and I was like, how the hell did he get the emperor, who is the cousin of Marie Antoinette, right, to green light the marriage of Figaro? That wasn't very clear. Like I, for the, from the movie, I didn't get how that happened. They tried to make it look like there was some sort of reason behind it. Mm -hmm. But for me, it wasn't sufficient because the marriage of Figaro was one of the plays that started the French Revolution mm -hmm. that got hit, that Marie Antoinette's, like, five years later. Well, he mentions her when yeah. they're talking about the, the opera. And I was like, how did that even happen? That's crazy yeah. to me because that what that play was written by Beaumarchais and uh, it was about at the time it was completely revolutionary because it's about a servant defying his master the lord and it caused so much uproar in France it was very popular and i think like people were killed like trampled to death like it was like a complete you know it was just the, the event that started everything. You know? Yeah, I thought that was interesting as well. Something else I wanted to mm -hmm. ask you about, because I kept thinking about this, you know, how contemporary it felt. And we can mm -hmm. get into the yeah. what we thought of the depictions of things and mm -hmm. the characters and things like that in a minute. But I thought it was interesting how Foreman managed to make a film mm -hmm. that felt, and this is kind of the thing that filmmakers try to do, and mm -hmm. I think people who write any kind of fiction try to do, mm -hmm. is to, if you're writing about the, something about historical, mm -hmm. you're trying to make it relevant to today. Yeah. And I think there was a lot of elements that are relevant to musicians today. Yeah. In that, you know, the emperor mm -hmm. is kind of like the corporation. Mm -hmm, definitely. I, I totally got that. Yeah. Yeah. And so he has to constantly get approval from the from the head of the corporation in mm -hmm. order to do the thing that he believes mm -hmm. is a valuable work, mm -hmm. that the work has value. Mm -hmm. But the what I thought was so funny about it. So the, the guy who plays Emperor Emperor Joseph the Second is Jeffrey Jones. Uh -huh. And he's such a great character uh -huh. actor. He's got this half eye open you mm -hmm. know his his he's constantly sleepy mm -hmm. and he goes okay well that's that or he's like okay yeah sure he doesn't even care and right. meanwhile there's this artist working on something who cares passionately about what he's doing mm -hmm. and he just wants the yes and he wants the funding mm -hmm. and he wants to make the money to do this incredible piece mm -hmm. and there's a bit at the beginning yeah. he commissions him for this opera mm -hmm. And then afterwards he says, and I remember this scene, this part scene in particular when I first saw the film. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of scenes stuck out, but this one did. And he said, it was great. It was fantastic. It was brilliant. But there were too many notes. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, you know, the script writing is better than what I'm doing right now. And then his reply is, which notes would you like me to take out? Because he, no, because he said first, there are too many notes. Too many notes? Well, yeah, just... Cut off a few, and it'll be perfect. Right. Yeah, take out a few, and it'll be perfect. And then Mozart says, well, which ones yeah. in particular? <laughs> because it's so, and this is so, this happens to me every day of my life mm -hmm. and my work. And it's also indicated clearly in the beginning of the movie that the emperor has no ear for music. That's right. Mm -hmm. Good point. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, we do establish that early on in yeah. his character, yeah. And Salieri knows that he has no taste and no ear for music, and, and he just goes along with whatever. Yeah, and this is the thing that I think that artists are constantly trying to do, or having to do, mm -hmm. is they know their craft, and they know what's good, mm -hmm. and they're constantly trying to please people who don't give a shit mm -hmm. about whatever the art in question is. Yeah. They have another agenda. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, this is the same thing with painting, you know, like all mm -hmm. of the genius painters of the Renaissance and mm -hmm. things like that. They had to go through this as well. Mm -hmm. So I thought that played out really well. And then we see Mozart's character as portrayed in the film as kind of this bohemian, freewheeling, free thinking, mm -hmm. not really planning anything, but just doing his work. Mm -hmm. And then one of the things that I've kind of resonated with me right now mm -hmm. is he has he's got to decide if he's going to do the commission thing mm -hmm. or if he's going to take on the 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 pupil mm -hmm. you know things that make money mm -hmm. or is he going to you know use the time that he has to work on his yeah. work of art 
the thing, one of the things I liked is he's working all day long. Yeah. Yeah. Mozart was not Mozart because he was just partying. Exactly. Yeah. It takes actual work yeah. to do this yeah. sort of thing. So there's genius and there is like work that killed him. Yeah. Like, and, literally. Yeah. And, and the genius and the work mm-hmm. go together. Yeah. Even though they did say, um, and this was kind of a... Um, a uh, goodwill hunting moment. The notes are already in his head, mm-hmm. and he just the rest of it is just dictation. I actually kind of believe that about Mozart, though. Oh, I do too. Yeah, yeah, I do too. Because his training started so early, and so he it's probably in his yeah, mind. Yeah. It's in his conscience. Yeah, and his up uh, his unconscious. Yeah, because because there's like genius, but there's also there's genius, there's inspiration, there's passion, but there's also like extremely early training Mm -hmm. so it's like second nature to him right um he could probably just see the score like a language yeah you don't have to think about the words yeah he's just you know all the stuff that average people need to kind of go through Mm -hmm. like you know check Mm -hmm. to see which note sounds like what he probably doesn't have to go he probably didn't have to go through that we see this in salieri as he's actually like he's working on the yeah he's working on the piece and he's like Oh, yes, there's the chord. But he has to do it. Mm -hmm. He has to try it Mm -hmm. to hear how it sounds. Mm -hmm. Another thing I thought was interesting was, you know, this is a time before recorded music. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the recording of music Mm -hmm. was the sheet music, was Mm -hmm. notation, Mm -hmm. right? So not all cultures have this. Mm -hmm. Uh, Europe has its notation. Yeah. And we all know what that Mm is. And it was just interesting to see it play out where... It's almost like what today we would say, let me hear your song. Mm -hmm. It's let me look at your song. Mm -hmm. And actually, Stuart Copeland, I saw an interview with Stuart Copeland recently, and he said there's two types of musicians. There's musicians of the eye and there's musicians of the ear. Mm -hmm. And the classic, because he works with classical musicians, Mm -hmm. and classical musicians, they need to look at the sheet music, Mm -hmm. and then they know the song. Mm -hmm. And then there's musicians of the ear who hear, Mm -hmm. and then they kind of go from there Mm -hmm. in order to see where they fit in. Yeah. So this is a movie about, you know, musicians of the eye. Right. There's a strange sort of, I don't know if you'd call it synesthesia, but they see the sheet music and then it's like, oh my God, this is, I'm overwhelmed by the beauty of this. There's there's the scene when Uh Mozart's wife goes to Salieri Uh and shows him the original pieces of his music that mm-hmm. he's composed mm-hmm. and there's not a, a mis- there's not a cross out there's not mm-hmm. an edit it's just all there mm-hmm. and he hears it as he's looking at it mm-hmm. and he's overwhelmed he drops mm-hmm. the music because mm-hmm. he's so overwhelmed by how good it is mm-hmm. i thought the whole notation thing was interesting yeah it was very interesting and i and i believe that to a certain extent you can totally see mozart's scores and hear it i didn't sp- study classical harmony that much but from what i remember it was all very diatonic at that point like it wasn't atonal like it was very i don't want to say basic but you know it was just like these are the notes that form a definite harmony and you can't do certain things right you can't use a tritone when you write like counterpoint like you know there are certain they were very very specific rules that were established during the baroque period by johann sebastian bach mm-hmm. and handel and you know these guys who mozart studied mm-hmm. from the age of like 2 and yeah. so he when you master this language which i assume every the court composer did i would assume that you could hear it because mm-hmm. it's just so, it's universal. It's a universal language. Mm-hmm. So it's like, I would assume that you would, back then, you would be able to look at the music and just totally hear it. It's interesting. I, yeah. I just want to know, like, because I don't read music, I can read drum music if I have a mm-hmm. lot of time to sit mm-hmm. and look at it. Mm-hmm. But I don't read me. Mu- I can't sight read. Mm-hmm. I, I just wonder about how that works in the brain, mm-hmm. you know. You would probably sing it to yourself. Maybe, yeah, you'd yeah. Hear, kind of hear your own voice. I'm wondering what you hear, yeah. or if you do hear, mm-hmm. when you see beauty in a composition that you're reading. I just, I just, you're probably right. You probably hear your own voice. Yeah, I think you hear your own voice. Yeah. And yeah. then, you know, but like an idealized version of your own yeah, voice. Yeah, yeah. Because there is talk about the different instrumentation. Yeah. But you can't, you can't define that in notation right. unless there's, you know, there's certain frequencies. Obviously, you would figure that the mm-hmm. contrabassoon or whatever would take up this, you know, this register or something mm-hmm. like that. Or the mm-hmm. violin would take mm-hmm. this register mm-hmm. or something like that. But you, you can't really know from reading the music. Mm-hmm. But I guess, yeah, you just carry mm-hmm. that melody. So and there was a lot of that in this right, movie. Right. And, um, 
And then we get the the scene at the end, which is so beautiful, mm. um, of him sick on the bed, yeah. exhausted. Yeah. And Salieri is notating mm. the rec the rest of the requiem mm-hmm, for him. Mm-hmm. Which apparently historically never happened. Never happened. But it's it's a it's a moment, you know, that where you get that like someone is dictating mm-hmm. what we need to hear. You know, he says mm-hmm. F major here, second beat of the measure, da 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 and then he mentions it. And then and then he says, go to A minor. And, and there's a moment where he goes, no, that doesn't work. I don't understand. That doesn't work. Mm-hmm. He's like, no, try, listen, it works. Mm-hmm. Just double the, the melody. And he's, you know, I, I forget exactly what was said, mm-hmm. but then he goes, oh, oh, oh my God. Yes, I get what you're doing now. Mm-hmm. I'm doing a very poor reproduction mm-hmm. of this, but mm-hmm. it's, it's very, <laughs> it's it's like high drama at the end of this yeah, movie. Yeah. Almost yeah. like, um, you know, strangely enough, almost like an action scene at the end. Yeah, where, where totally. It of, was mesmerizing, right? It yeah, was. Yeah, and it yeah. was really beautiful. And I, I was on every word mm-hmm. hearing how he's telling him how this music goes. Yeah. And I think um, the reason, the, the scene where um, Salieri doesn't get what he's doing, I think is like, again, I might be mistaken. I totally forgot a lot of this information from back when I learned it. But Mozart did a lot of things for the first time. And that's why Beethoven really wanted to study with mm-hmm, Mozart mm-hmm. and stuff like that. One of them was, if I'm not mistaken, like the stacking. So there was like a melody, like a soprano melody line, right? And then there was like a, almost like a bass line. So it kind of sounded, and I said like, he's like Dr. Dre yeah. <laughs> with his own samples. Because yeah. it's kind of like He's building harmonically. Music, yeah. But also creating like different movements. So in jazz, mm-hmm. we would mm-hmm. call it the grid, right? Mm. Different grids. Like there were three, four different grids, right? And so the voice or, you know, the violin or whatever would be doing. And then it's like. And then there's a boom, boom. You know, there was like a lot of things going on at the same time. And All that's in his why, head. Yeah. And that's why Salieri didn't understand that. And that. I think is the foundation of pop music. Mm-hmm. And that's why Mozart, a lot of people say that Mozart started pop music. And mm, I think that's okay. very, very important. Well, it's probably because of the harmonic richness and the timbre richness of, totally. the different, of the different instruments going on. It's almost, yeah. you know, the whole thing about an orchestra is it uses the full range of the f- mm-hmm. free, you know, spectrum of hearing. Mm-hmm. So if you look at a piano, right, it's got mm-hmm. 88 keys. And that's the reason why they compose on a piano is because that's the full spectrum of tonalities. Mm-hmm. And the orchestra takes up these areas, mm-hmm. you know, the low bass, yeah. the mid bass, the the mid range, mm-hmm. the high mids, and then the highs. I guess the thing about Mozart is is he had all of the orchestra in his head, and I mm-hmm. guess the best con- composers do this. Mm-hmm. There's like a hip hop element to you know, like it's what he's doing is very universal and very very just primal almost. And a lot of people say that about Mozart. Mm. The most universally appealing music is statistically Mozart, the Beatles, Michael Jackson, Mm -hmm. and they all have this thing in common. Mm -hmm. They're just universally appealing Mm -hmm. to us as animals. Like at an animal level, there's something very appealing that we all feel something. Uh, Mozart is also said to be the preferred composer of cats. You know, like that kind of thing. Yeah, Cats love music, dogs (laughs) don't give a shit. Yeah, and you know, the Beatles too, right? The Beatles. Mm-hmm. And, and so there's, I think there's an element of universality that music has. And wrote Mozart was, you know, he's claimed as one of the, the greatest to have touched the most people. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. that, I think there's something very special about that mm-hmm. in his genius. There are mm-hmm. a lot of geniuses, Igor Stravinsky. Well, I was thinking of you know Stravinsky I, yeah, because yeah. they say that Stravinsky was the father of heavy metal mm-hmm. because of the yeah, Rite of yeah, Spring. Exactly. Dun 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 dun. dun, dun. Yeah. You know that's ri- that's a yeah. riff. Yeah. That's a guitar riff. Yeah, <laughs> that's really funny. Yeah, I find that there are some parallels between Mozart and Igor Stravinsky, but we'll get well, to Stravinsky's, that. Well, Stravinsky's. Yeah, <laughs> it's too bad we can't do a movie. I don't think there's a movie. There on is Stravin- a movie. Is there? Stravinsky. Because Stravinsky. And you know what it's called? What? It's called it's called Stravinsky and Chanel. <laughs> They uh, were apparently a couple at some point. Who's Chanel? Coco Chanel, babe. The the most important Chanel's designer. number five. Yes, the most important designer of fashion history. Mm, really? Yeah, because Stravinsky. I I love Stravinsky because that guy's a madman mm-hmm. in a very beautiful way. Mm-hmm. But we're not talking about Stravinsky. Yeah. But you know, there are a lot of geniuses, like I said. 
But there's a certain type of genius that appeals to everybody at a very primal level. Yeah. And Mozart was one of I them, I can see right? that. So we feel very tender towards him, you know, yeah. for this man who gave us all of this. Yeah. And I think the movie was working with that. We are I, already biased towards Mozart. Yeah. And yeah. again, in the same way that we're biased towards Shakespeare. Mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. and again, I see a parallel between this and Shakespeare mm-hmm. in Love. This came before Shakespeare mm-hmm. in Love. I love these fictionalized possibilities of what was happening in a mm. historical event. Let's talk about things like music performance and mm-hmm. the and the characters and the actors. Mm-hmm. What did you think of the way the music was performed in the film? Well, I think I liked that they actually put up Full productions of opera. That yeah. was crazy. Full wow, 1984. And like, lengthy, <laughs> lengthy. <laughs> yeah, I was like, wow, they had money in the 80s. You know, the studios yeah. really invested. Yeah. Um, yeah, the golden Apparently, 80s. Apparently, he had problems financing this film, oh. getting this film financed, because it was like the MTV era. And it's like, here you got a bunch of people in, in powdered wigs and, and doing classical music. It was hard mm-hmm. to get the film financed. But apparently they got enough money for it. Yeah, I mean, it, it, that, it really fascinated me. That must have cost a fortune. So, you know, in addition to the costumes and shooting in Prague, they had to do these full operas with the whole sets and everything. And that was just really impressive. I don't know if that will ever happen in a movie again. You know, I don't It'll really probably, see. if it happens again, it'll be a Joe Wright film. You're right. You're totally right, <laughs> aren't you? Yeah. I definitely do think that they should... Re- it's time for another Mozart movie, mm. I mm. think. I thought um, if I had a criticism, uh, mm-hmm. I wish that they had sang live in the film. And But this, again, is the the mid-80s, and the, and the 80s were a weird time for doing sound in films, yeah. too. It was very yeah. canned sound effects. Okay. yeah. Um, and they what happened is you could tell that the actors were lip-syncing to the music that would be in the film. Right. But then the singers, the opera singers would have to act too. And some a lot of times you don't get the actor and the singer together. Yeah, in that's one true. person. That's true. Especially opera but singers. But I suppose you don't. you could have. I mean, you could have done that um, and then had the orchestra play. It would have been much more difficult. But, you know, they did this with uh, Les Miserables, yeah. you know. I also think that it's very complicated to get opera singers on set to work those hours because they have very Yeah, that's specific, true. It's a very yeah. different um, and different very union. Very costly. Very costly. <laughs> yeah. Imagine, like, some opera singer singing that. And also playing that part. I guess That's it's kind crazy. of crazy. They must have really thought about that. That must be an impossible task. But I would it, but say it didn't that it's look, impossible. The singing didn't look real. It really didn't. <laughs> but it never does. But again, it's it the mid-80s. It was a lot better than the Veronica movie. Yeah, that's true. But um, <laughs> this is also before, this is also 1980s editing. Mm-hmm. And I think if you would, if you do this later, the faster paced editing, we're not lingering on the person singing mm-hmm. quite so much. It's it's like like something Steven Spielberg said about making Jaws. He's mm-hmm. like, I, I wanted to cut it, you know, two frames later mm-hmm. than Thelma Schoonmacher wanted mm-hmm. to make the cut because I always wanted a little bit more shark. It turned out she was correct mm-hmm. because if you see too much of the shark, it, it's fake. So with editing uh, pace today, yeah, yeah. it might not look quite so fake because of mm-hmm. the pace of the editing. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I accept the fakeness, though. And I, it doesn't bother it me. Does, it does Probably because I'm an 80s much. kid. Yeah. But remember, but I did think about this. So when I was growing up, Every movie that was set wherever, it could be set in India or China, everybody spoke American English, and there were a lot of New York accents in this movie. (laughs) So this is something I wanted to talk about. This is my problem with the film. It's a very Americanized movie. And you said it from the first frame. Yeah, you, like, from, where, from the first He's obviously shot. from New York. Yeah, yeah. It sounds like a dude from, you know, You know, another movie <laughs> is Martin Scorsese's The Passion of Christ, uh-huh. where Harvey Keitel just would not lose his New York Brooklyn There's accent. There's so many <laughs> movies like this. There are so Jesus, many. what do you want me to do? Yeah. Uh, Kevin Costner in Robin Hood in 1990. Oh, well, yeah, that's that an was one crazy. Too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, and, the, you know, it's the same language. It's English. Right. Why not cast an English actor? Right. <laughs> but anyway, Hollywood used to do this for decades, right? There was Memoirs of, the Ga- of a Geisha, 
is the mm-hmm. most recent yeah. one that I can think of. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, they stopped doing this. Did you notice this? Well, they started going for uh, more authenticity, I think. Yeah, we're watching Pachinko on Apple TV. Oh my God, talk about an authentic... Oh my gosh, Busan accents, authentic yeah. Busan accents, mm-hmm. a trilingual lead yeah, that, who that speaks guy. perfect, like everything. Yeah. And I was like... Yeah, what happened to the Hollywood that I remember that was used to well, be so Well, it used lazy. to be a different audience. Yeah. The, the audience so the whole thing with mm-hmm. like the history of film, in every era there's there's what will be accepted. Mm-hmm. And you know, the thing that a lot of people don't realize about filmmaking is that it is again this it's this idea of suspension of disbelief. Mm-hmm. Are you willing to accept what's going on? Mm-hmm. And in the 80s, you know, when you when you'd hear I'm thinking of the movie The Thing with Kurt Russell for some reason. Mm. And he punches somebody, it sounds like Pap! you know, it's like, Yeah. It's it's a it's a canned sound mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that they lifted off of their, you know, library of mm-hmm. tapes and just inserted into the soundtrack. Things like that. Take that to every level of filmmaking. Mm-hmm. It's like that's what they accept. Today mm-hmm. the realism has become so hyper correct yeah. because we don't accept those things anymore mm-hmm. there's kind of a weird phase that happened with computer graph uh mm-hmm. cgi computer mm-hmm. animation mm-hmm. you know some of the like early 90s cgi there's films like the lawnmower man but yeah um so you know the codes here were just different 1984 is a different era yeah so i was thinking about this i was like but then they can't all have German accents. That's stupid, right? Yeah, how do they do it? But it's it's the disconnect. Like yeah. so there's Tom Hulse Hulse? Hulse. Hulse yeah. who played Mozart. Yeah. Total American through and through. Yeah, total American. And then you've got Elizabeth Barrage, mm-hmm. total American. Mm-hmm. And you've got No, but okay, so I, I thought and it then was. And then a bunch weird. of and then a bunch of European actors. No, they were they were American. But then there was one Italian who had an actual Italian accent. Yeah. <laughs> and right. then Salieri was British. And I thought yeah. that was really random because yeah. it's like either make all of them American. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, it, there's this and then disconnect the really in accents. really weird part, and I pointed this out earlier, there was one person in the entire movie with a German accent, and it was the hairdresser. Mm. I thought that was really racist. Oh, kind of the gay hairdresser? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was really politically incorrect, but in 1984, yeah. and nobody noticed. Well, also in 2022, I'm like, why aren't they speaking German? Why are they speaking English? Well, yeah, that would have to be an entirely different production, though. Yeah, but I don't think yeah. they do that anymore. Yeah, exactly. That's what like, I'm they saying. Don't, they don't yeah. do that in movies anymore. So that they wouldn't... A Mozart movie today would have to would be Would have to be in German. German. Yeah. yeah. Right. I think. Well, not necessarily, but it would it would be very hard for that to be... Mm-hmm. That to fly with audiences yeah, today. So. Because they would be like, well, this is stupid. I you agree. Know? Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I thought Tom Hulse was... He was okay. You know, yeah. it... <laughs> Actually, Mark Hamill mm-hmm. was considered for this role. Really? Yeah. I don't um, see it. But then Milos Forman thought people would have too much of an association with Star Wars because Star yeah. Wars was huge at that yeah. time. Yeah, that would have been interesting. But I, I don't know how I felt about that performance. It's, yeah, I don't either. Yeah. It's, it's kind of, it's very Americanized yeah. and it's very, it's over the top. And I guess that's what Milos Forman was trying to do. Mm-hmm. And he does that in mm-hmm. his films. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I, I'm with you. This disconnect with the accents um, mm. is a little bit off-putting. It was like way too American too sometimes. Like, yeah. you know, at least have like a somewhat ashtray accent, you know, of a pan-English, you know, yeah, or, or whatever. You know, try a German accent. Or get no, I think a British accent is a good way to go for these kinds of movies. <laughs> That's um, so funny though. But then if I see a clear... Like a clearly New Jersey accent from this Austrian lord. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like that's really weird. Yeah. Like he was, there was a Jersey guy. Mm-hmm. And then in the very beginning, there was a guy who was clearly from like New York, like Times Square in 1983. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that, those kinds of things were popping up a little bit and yeah. bothering me. And Cynthia Nixon was in this movie. Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> I thought she was Amy Adams. Yeah, that that's weird because Amy Adams is too young to have been... There. Well, of course, I yeah. realize that now. Yeah. yeah, Cynthia Nixon, I remembered her because I had watched this movie so many times as a child when Sex and the City first came out in 1999 or 98. I immediately recognized Cynthia Nixon. 
movies about music. This is another thing I wanted to talk about from the movie, right? Okay. Does did Salieri in the movie the Salieri, not the historical figure, but the the Salieri the character Antonio in the film. Salieri in the movie was he? really in it for the music. Here's my take on yeah. his character. That's a very good question. Mm -hmm. I think he adored music. Mm -hmm. And he also was a resentful person. Mm -hmm. And those two can easily go together. Okay, I get it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it kind of drove him mad. For me, it was like, that's a happy life. Maybe it's because I'm such a, a professional, but unsuccessful professional singer. What? I mean, you know, I'm not like... I'm sort of like a hired singer, I'm not really an artist. And so for me, you know, there's always this part of me that's like, well, at least I get to do it. Sure. And I've arrived at a place where that's enough for me. And he was, you know, he was composing. He was the court composer. Right. He was, you know, he was the, were, as the end of the movie showed, yeah. he was the king of mediocrity. Yeah. But it's like, well, at least you get to do it. And that's what you asked God for. You wanted to become a musician, no, a composer. No, he didn't want to become a musician. Mm -hmm. He wanted to become great. Yeah. He wanted to become a great composer. And he never got there. And yeah. that's, that, I think, is also kind of a... A male thing? No, it's an allusion to the idea <laughs> uh, of the corporate yeah, music. Yeah, you're, you're right. You're never yeah, going yeah. to achieve greatness if you stick with the corporate agenda. Yeah. It's never going to happen. Yeah, you're And it totally shouldn't right. happen. Yeah. Please, please, people who plan the future, people who are working on AI, mm -hmm. people who are you know, doing whatever they do for their careers, mm -hmm. please don't make the corporate great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's my... That's my request for the children of the future. Because you know, <laughs> right? I mean, I believe anyway, mm -hmm. the children are future. <laughs> right. Teach them well and let them lead the way. Show them, Show all, them all the, the beauty, beauty they, they possess, possess inside. inside. You know what else you should do? Give them a sense of pride to make it easier. Let the children laughter remind us how we used to be. I remember long ago. All right, I think we're done. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I just, I, I love Whitney Houston. I had to do that. That was great. Yeah. I'm glad I could cajole you into that. I believe that next, our next episode, mm -hmm. we are going to have a guest, a special guest. Oh, yes. We are going to have... Busan's own Gordon Badsali Jr. Mm -hmm. on the show. Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk about the film Round Midnight. Ooh. Starring, yes, starring mm -hmm. Dexter Gordon. That's crazy. To me. I know. I've never seen this movie. I've never seen it either. Yeah. I thought this would be a good movie for Gordon yeah. because he's a jazz trumpeter. Yeah. So that is going to be fun, I think. That is going to be fun. Um, I'm like, what? Dexter Gordon starred in a movie? <laughs> I think there's a few uh, musicians in this movie acting. Oh. And it's a fictionalized story. That's crazy. It takes place in Paris. Uh-huh. It's about jazz in Paris. Yeah, I mean, I always thought that Chet Baker would be the one to star in a movie, but apparently, I don't really. My funny Valentine. <laughs> you sound nothing like him. I'm sorry, yeah, I love I you, start, but I started, you sound nothing. I think like my first note was okay, and then Chet I didn't Baker know where I was going with my melody during any era, Chet Baker era. Like that my was not even funny Valentine. Oh, okay, that was okay. Yeah. All right, I'll work on my Chet Baker. Yeah. My funny, my funny oh yeah okay yeah i can hear it now yeah i, I yeah yeah so that's gonna be in two weeks mm -hmm. yeah and if you get a chance please give us a review because that would really help yeah a kind review would really help because we have i don't think we have any reviews yeah even a bad review would help though Really? The algorithm, yeah. Okay. Yeah, the, we, we need, um, you know, we put a lot of work into the show. We're mm -hmm. not, I'm sorry to sound like I'm begging, but we do put a lot of work into the show and mm -hmm. we have no reviews. Mm -hmm. And reviews are really the way that we get some notice mm -hmm. from the bots on the internet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we would really appreciate if, you know, it just takes a couple of sentences. Yeah, you could all, you could write like, Jim and Cece suck. 
and that would be or Jim and Cece are awesome Mm -hmm. and that's it and that's all you have to do Mm -hmm. yeah and we would really appreciate it Mm -hmm. but if you do say that we suck we would like to know why we suck Mm -hmm. and we do have a YouTube channel Mm -hmm. so you can listen there it's um it's not thriving (laughs) our humble little mom and pop operation here (laughs) but you could leave comments there you know All right. All right. So long, everybody. See ya. Under the moonlight, I'll sing you a song. So you'd magically feel a lot less alone. Hopefully, they'll live eternally. If we paint ourselves all bright with stories of here. Poets and sadness and war Of immeasurable pain, unconditional love Movies about music